In October of 2020, Beam agreed to pay a criminal monetary penalty of $19.5 million to resolve a government investigation into Jim Beam's violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Come on now, get a sip. Talking about shelf turds. Talk about shelf turds. Talk about shelf turds. And uh, get yourself a glass. My name is David, this is Kira, and welcome to Shelf Turds, and tonight we're comparing two bourbons that have near identical stat sheets. Similar mash bills, similar proof, similar age, and similar price points. And Kira, hmm. did you know one of these distilleries was recently a victim in a $700,000 whiskey warehouse distribution con? A whiskey con? Did well, they buy empty barrels? No, the con was that somebody stole the whiskey from them in a, in a scheme, a con. Oh, so like uh, the the New York Stock Exchange. How is that a con? Because we give them money and they're like, <laughs> we got it. Do you know a lot about the New York Stock Exchange? I do. Tell there's me. a bear market and there's a bull market. Which one's the good one? I can't remember I t oh, wait, I took all of these classes in college. Hold on. I got in trouble not that long ago for saying a bull market was a good thing. <clears throat> I was told very adamantly that it was a bear market that was a good thing. You can't name something that are two different things with the same first letter. It's so confusing. Why not? So Because I just don't... I already get words and letters backwards in my mind. So by calling something bear and bull and they're totally different... No way. That's not going to help me. So... You bear to it. No, you bear away from it. Wait, don't you grin and bear it? No, you want to bear away. Are you sure? Because what if yes. it's like, I barely have the amount of money I want to invest in the market because it's so good right now. Oh, do I have it backwards? Then I said it right to you the first time when I yelled at you. What is the right way to do it? You were, what, well, you were an econ major? Yes, and finance. I double majored. <laughs> And Kira, did you know that one of these distilleries was recently fined $19 million in a foreign criminal bribery case? And by recently, I mean October of 2020. Pretty recent. Who did they bribe? I am going to bet $500 that was an old politician. Did they just use the money to go buy a boat? And go on an island? Because politicians love freaking islands. Tell us more about politicians. They're so stupid. They're like, hey, everyone come to my island. And there's nothing there. They didn't even develop it. They forgot about it because they're stupid. And they're like, oh, I don't know how to develop an island. And then everyone has to come to the island. And they're like, hey, it's a festival. Let's tell everyone Ja Rule is coming. Holla, holla. Politicians only know how to buy stupid islands that aren't developed and invite people to them and expect them to do all the work. They also only know how to hunt. Maybe not even hunt, but dress up like an old-time hunter and just go walk around in the woods with a gun because they're just stupid. Hey, wait, is that a Dick Cheney joke? Who's that? Mash bill, age statement, and proof. 1792 technically has an undisclosed mash bill, but according to BreakingBourbon.com, it's rumored to be 75% corn, 15% rye, and 10% malted barley. Technically, it's no age statement, but in the press release from Barton 1792 Distillery in 2016, they pegged that son of a bitch at 8.5 years. It is 125 proof, and you can get it for right around 50 bucks. Uh, minimum shelf price in Michigan is right around $47. I was going to make a joke there where politicians love 1792 because of the no age statement. <laughs> but then you said eight years. I was like, okay, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> What was that old joke about, um, oh, you can say you really love kids, but you can't say you love 12-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> Knob Creek Single Barrel Reserve 120 proof is 77% corn, 13% rye, 10% malted barley. It is age stated. It's nine years, 120 proof. Uh, MSRP, some places, is right around 50. Actually, I think the Michigan minimum shelf price for that is about 60. 
Let's get into our very first taste of 1792 foolproof. Lemon. Strong, sour, vapored lemon. So I'm getting uh, like a bread dough. A bread dough? Yeah. A very faint, ripe strawberry. You know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of vanilla in there too. Like bread, vanilla, yeast. Oh, I am smelling, uh, what is that, nutmeg? No. Yeah, I think that's nutmeg. So I'm going to say this. I've always loved 1792. Man, you should warm up before you get into it. It is punchy. Yeah. This is, um, who sings that song, Nelly? This is a Nelly song. Uh, it's hot in here. Go ahead and sing it. So take off all of your clothes. So how do you do that with liquor? It's sweet. I'm getting actually a sweet old leather taste. Bread, maybe like some some glaze from like a cinnamon bread. Mmm, yeah. Yeah, so like cinnamon bread with glaze on it. So far, I am getting a lot of dark kind of a berry with cinnamon and nutmeg. But I do get a soaked leather. It's just soaked and it's got rotten berries around it. I want to find nuts, like a nut in here. I can show you some. I have a headache. So Kira, do you think it's gonna change your opinion at all if I tell you a little bit more about 1792 and the distillery? Well, I love 1792. Nothing can deter this from my heart, but you can try. I just wanted to educate. The Barton 1792 Distillery is the seventh largest distillery in the world. The distillery is located in the heart of Bardstown, Kentucky. The history of the people involved with the distillery date all the way back to 1845. In the mid-1800s, John Graves Mattingly built several distilleries. One of them was named J.G. Mattingly & Sons, and the other one was called the Marion County Distillery. The J.G. Mattingly & Sons Distillery was purchased at auction by Paul Jones Jr. and he changed the name to the Four Roses Distillery. Ooh, well, I like that. And also, I'm glad he took it away from Mattingly. Why? You should not have a last name that is an adverb. <laughs> Makes no sense. Tell me how Mattingly is an adverb. He's like, hello, Mr. Mattingly. Was he just matting something? Quit with your stupid names. I don't have think, a regular name that's not an adverb. First of all, I don't think you chose it. Second of all, I don't think Mattingly is an adverb. It does. Anything that ends in L-Y is an adverb. The Marion County Distillery was operational in the 1870s, but went bankrupt by 1916. Enter Tom Moore, who helped to resurrect the distillery, and eventually bought the distillery next door to it, merged the two, and that's what became known as the Tom Moore Distillery. In 1944, Tom's son, Con Moore, sold the distillery to Oscar Getz. Getz changed the name to Barton Distillery, which was a name he made up and, quote-unquote, picked out of a hat. Really? Yes. Back then, though, did they have pen and paper to be able to do that? They definitely did not. The uh, Declaration of Independence was not written on pen and paper, which came... I forgot about 200 that. 200 years in front of that. I just forgot what years things were, okay? You just forgot that? You don't gotta remind me when the dinosaurs had paper and all that stuff. Oscar Getz was intrigued by the history of distilling in Kentucky. He was a prolific collector of whiskey memorabilia. His collection got to be so big that his wife forced him to, and I quote, get all that stuff out of our house. She keeps coming in, she's like, there's a still here? And another still, how many stills do you have to surround yourself with? Aren't I enough? And plus, how much can you have if it's only been 1944? Who's buying things? You know... They're still trying to build roads. It's been a while since we did Mysteries of the Histories, but distilling... I mean, if you've been paying attention, we're well into the early 1900s here. Distilling has been going on since like the 1700s in America. Well... Getz had to house his memorabilia at the distillery, and he turned it into a mini-museum. Barton was the very first company to ever offer distillery tours. Eventually, the Sazerac Company of New Orleans, Louisiana, purchased the entire Barton brand catalog. Oh, so they're stealing prize money. 
No. Fries recipes. When you go to Meyer and you buy groceries, are you stealing groceries? Depends on if they uh, scan them all. Sometimes they don't. I don't correct them either. In 2016, a Lithuanian man stole a whole lot of whiskey from Barton in a whiskey distribution con job. Using fraudulent documents he created himself, Vismantis Daniela pretended to be a legitimate shipping operation catering to distilleries. Barton was one of three distilleries who decided to not point out the fakeness of his documentation, fearing Vismantis might reply with, and I quote, Are you just saying that because I'm Lithuanian? End quote. Barton's portion of the $700,000 in stolen whiskey was worth approximately $130,000. Wow. Of note, Brown Foreman, also Jack Daniels, was the most non-racist of all the distilleries as they were the only distillery to be hit three separate times by Vismantis. Despite the fakeness of the documents, JD feared Vismantis might retort with something like, you're just pointing out how fake these are because I'm Lithuanian. The total cost of the three times they were hit was close to $500,000. The, they're clearly fake. Just say, I'm going to get my lawyers involved. And you know what he's going to say as soon as you say that? What? Are you saying that because I'm Lithuanian? And then I'll say, no, I'm saying that because this is a fake doc. You wrote this in pencil. Fast forward to 2018, attempted to increase sales. Barton's 1792 distillery began to offer free samples of whiskey to an entirely untapped market, fish. In late June of 2018, the distillery shared some 9,000 barrels of whiskey to the local aquatic life. The marketing plan turned out to be a massive disaster as over 1,000 fish indulged too much and drank themselves to death. <laughs> Why would they say, hmm... You know who would like this whiskey fish? Why? And so the fish were swimming in it or were the fish drinking it? Because the fish have currency. Babe. Oh, I get it. This is a joke. Sometimes I think you're really gillable. Gillable? <laughs> yeah, that's stupid. Moving on to Knob Creek Single Barrel Reserve 120 proof. Hmm, even though it's the same mash bill, they don't have the same smell. Really? Mm-hmm. Did you know that about whiskey? Like a pepper fruit with some like herbs. More earthy than I remember Knob Creek being. Hmm. I still get some fruit off of this though too. Mm-hmm. A little bit of like an old Coke, <laughs> which I get from a lot. I feel like I get that a lot. Yeah, I can see that. Knob Creek. Typically, I get nut off the nose, but here on this this single barrel reserve 120, it's different. Mm -mm, yeah, I don't get any nuts either. Kind of want that. I do feel I'm getting more flavor out of this Nam Creek compared to the 792 right now. The fruity sweetness I'm getting, the burnt brown sugar I'm tasting out of, but also nut wise, I can't place it, but it's pretty close to those blue diamond dark chocolate powdered almonds. I'm surprised that today I like the Knob Creek more than the 1792. I don't know why. Let me let me try it again. Yeah. I'll just try it again. This yes. one's hotting my jowls up. This one tastes like burnt brown sugar with some almonds that have gone bad. During the late 18th century, members of the Bohm family, who eventually changed the spelling of their surname to Beam, immigrated from Germany and settled in Kentucky. James Beauregard Beam managed the family business before and after Prohibition, rebuilding the distillery in 1933 in Claremont, Kentucky, near his Barstown home. So his first name was James? Like it wasn't short for anything? You don't just name someone James. Why it's, not? It's short for like Jonathan or... James is short for Jonathan? I think James is a nickname. It's not like, an actual name. No. What about James Madison? What James Vanderbeek? Van what, who's James Vanderbeek? What James Harden? I don't think James is a real first name. So what is James short for? I can't remember. I think it's short for Jamestown. Would you say that Jim is short for James? Oh, is that it? No, no. definitely not. One syllable names aren't a real name. One syllable names aren't a real name. No, they're nicknames. So Chris? Correct. 
Christopher. Oh, shit, I guess it was Mark. Yeah. But that could be short for Markison. There are people that are just named John. That is wrong. You should not just be more born with a name John. Are you sure? It's weird. What about, yes. Todd? What about Todd? Toddison. What about Chad? Now that's just a douchebag name. Launched in 1992, <laughs> Knob Creek is distilled under the direction of master distiller Fred No. Fred is the son of Knob Creek founder Booker No, who is the grandson of James, often referred to as Jim Beam. Great. Just keeping it all in the family. It's a good way to get diseases. In October of 2020. Oh, my favorite month. Why? Halloween, duh. In October of 20... And it's nice and cool. In October... And the leaves are changing color. In October of 2020, Beam agreed to pay a criminal monetary penalty of $19.5 million to resolve a government investigation into Jim Beam's violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The resolution arises in part out of Jim Beam's scheme to pay a bribe to an Indian government official in exchange for approval of a license to bottle a line of products that Beam sought to market and sell in India. Now I'm confused why this is a scheme. Can't you just sell things in India? They paid a bribe to him to sell something. Oh, they were like, hey, I'll give you money, you sell over here. Or just give us the approval that we need. I, just, I literally just read it. Now I get it. Jim was saying, hey, you, let me sell some stuff over there. I'll give you a little. And then he's like, okay. That's I think it's actually okay to, to bribe politicians with the hand jobs. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> because the job is still a job. And I quote, Beam and its Indian subsidiary not only paid bribes to Indian government officials, they falsified their books and records to conceal the corrupt activity, said Acting Assistant Attorney General Brian C. Rabbit of the Justice Department's Criminal Division. What an idiot! All you gotta do is write in your little ledger, two million dollars for a bowling outing. Then they'll be like, oh, okay, they just took everyone out bowling. That makes sense. It's so easy. Take it from the econ major that understands bear and bull markets. <laughs> According to its own admission, Beam paid a bribe of 1 million Indian rupees, which is approximate to only about 18,000 American dollars, to a senior Indian government official in exchange for that official's approval of the license to bottle ready-to-drink products that Beam sought to market and sell in India. Is that different than drinks that aren't ready to drink? I also found that confusing. The criminal monetary penalty for Beam reflects a 10% reduction off the bottom of the U.S. sentencing guideline fine range because Beam received partial credit for its remediation and cooperation with the government's investigation. That makes sense. What did it mean? It means... It meant this. <laughs> Give me 10% off. <laughs> oh, you too? <laughs> All right, so we only have a little bit left in both these cups. We're now going to compare them side by side and tell you... What we think now that we've had them both, we're a little warmed up. All right, Kira, side okay. by side, A, B, M. It's How like, sweet is this? It's, it's like, like a hot cotton candy. Mmm, yeah, it is. And it does do that melty thing in your mouth, like a cotton candy does. Mm -hmm. It just, like, disappears. I mean, in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. You nailed it. And the Knob Creek, I already feel comfortable with my notes there. I, that is a dry, roasted nut, and it's astringent and drying. Uh, probably a great mixer of some kind. I don't know that I'll be drinking that neat very often. I love it. I'm getting so much more flavor after I drink it from that 1972. Okay. Or 1727. Supposed tasting notes okay. for 1792 Full Proof from Breaking Bourbon, who said it was hot a lot in the article. On the nose, they said it was dry oak, caramel, and a dab of vanilla. On the palate, sweet corn, cinnamon, syrup-soaked raisins, dried cherries, and a dash of vanilla are all present. The palate is still very pleasant and the star of the show, offering a real nice mouthfeel. The finish, they said the heat lingers for quite a while, overpowering all the flavors before eventually fading away into bar soap, musty oak, white pepper, and wet grass. How do you feel about that? <laughs> 
I think that person lives in an attic. You know what? I'm just gonna get my typewriter out and write down what I smell. Even a bad finish this is on, on a really, really cheap whiskey. Doesn't go into bar soap, musty oak, and wet grass. That, that's a lethal combination. Supposed to tasting notes for Knob Creek 120 proof, breaking bourbon on the nose, very sweet. Brown sugar and caramel hit first, apple and toffee follow on the back end, a scent of leather. Look at me, I uh, think I said all of that. On the palate, at first you think the sip is gonna be harsh because of the nose, because they all said it was a little hot on the mm -hmm. nose, but it surprises you with a very rich and creamy sweetness. The palate consists of vanilla, maple syrup, and brown sugar that the nose foreshadowed. Yes, I completely agree with all of that. I disagree. Finish, hot and long lasting, full of cinnamon, oak, and leather. The sweetness from the nose and palate carries through to the end. I think they just heard me and wrote all that down. Moving to sex appeal of the bottle. What you have on your shelves says something about you. For your benefit, not mine, we've brought in local sexpert Kira, and she is gonna tell us which of these two bottles has a better sex appeal and will look better on your shelf. I'm coming over to do one of these bottles. And you know what? This one is not that interesting to me. I mean, it's nice, it's consistent looking, but this one looks like it has more money. I'm gonna go over here, $17.92. Sex Peel the Bottle goes to $17.92. Kira, close the show. <sighs> Someone gave money to a politician, and somebody gave money to a different politician. Actually, I don't, I don't know if there were any politicians here, but there had to have been nuts. Like, <laughs> comment, subscribe, and thank you for joining us on Shelf Turns. That one of the distilleries tested their whiskey on local fish. No, why would I know that? That's why just, would that just be something I just randomly know? That's just how these these standard format videos start. I mm. ask you questions and ask you if you did know if you knew them or not. No, you can just safely assume I know nothing. Oh, that actually makes more sense than saying that she was just had a weight problem. Was it? Is it bad to say problem? A weight opportunity. <laughs> Can't say they've got a leg problem when they're missing a leg. Clifton has an arm problem. <laughs> Clifton has an arm opportunity. <laughs> that sounds so ridiculous. Let's clarify for your bet. Okay. What is your definition of old? Um, 55 and older. <laughs> but do people work in the 60s? The 1960s so. or into their 60s? No, into their 60s. Yes, people work into their 60s. I'm gonna, okay. Are you I, Give or take five years, I'm gonna say 57 is old. Now that you're talking about the high proof scene, I'm just getting nail salon. So you're getting it now? Yeah, no, I am a little bit. Even when I get real in there, you know, like when I put my nose way in the cup and you try to make fun of me? I mean, it's there, but it's not there any more than any other 120 or 130 proof bourbon. Oh, I wouldn't have guessed this was that high, actually. Well, you wouldn't have had to. I said in the open what the proof was. <laughs> well, I wasn't listening, okay? Oh, 